Well, today we are launching into a brand new series that I've titled, Who Then Is This? Uh, From today through Easter Day, which, by the way, this year, Easter Day falls on April 1st. No fooling, it really does. Uh, But for these 13 weeks, from today until Easter Day, we are going to be exploring the story of Jesus as found in the gospel according to Mark. And the question that we're going to ask each week is simply this one. Who then is this? Who is this person known as Jesus? And as I've been thinking about this series, a number of options come to mind. For example, you could decide that Jesus was a liar that he's the ultimate snake oil salesman, that in order to gather a following, in order to make a name for himself, he decided to tell people anything he needed to tell them and do whatever he needed to do in order to gather this, this crowd that he knew he was lying all the way along. I, I, you could come to that conclusion, and over the years, some have decided that Jesus is just a liar. You could also come to the conclusion that Jesus is a lunatic. Because to say the things that Jesus said, thinking they're true, but they're not being true, well, then that just makes him a madman, doesn't it? I mean, that that he's just some deluded guy who really thought these things were true when they weren't. And some have come to that conclusion over the years. There are some, and this is actually really quite widely held, That Jesus is some form of a legend. Because it's really hard to to, to debate the fact that Jesus lived. I mean, there's, there's just too much historical record. And I'm not just talking Christian or biblical record. I'm talking about world history record. There's just too much world history record to deny the fact that there was a guy named Jesus who lived in Palestine in the first century. In fact, that he was crucified by the Roman government. I mean, this stuff is, you just can't debate that because it's, it's part of the historical record. And, and you might even be willing to say, you know, Jesus was a good teacher. He, he was a fantastic rabbi. He, he was this really charismatic figure. And he even died on a cross. But everything beyond that, that's just made up. That after he died, in order to sustain his legend... His followers made up the rest of the story. Like, all of, those, all of those stories about walking on water, come on, let's get real. People don't walk on water. People don't take a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and feed thousands of people. People, people don't heal. And they certainly don't come back from the dead. And, and all of those people will say. All of that stuff was added after the fact. In fact, you, you'll, you'll even hear someone to say, well, you know, the Bible was all, all, was all written after the fact in order to, to defend this legend that had developed about Jesus. And the reason the legend was developed is because it gave their followers power. And if you track the history of civilization, the church has had an obscene amount of power, and even more wealth associated with the story of Jesus. And so many, in fact, to some degree, I would suspect, even in this room, many have at least suspected that part of the story that we know about Jesus, that's, that's not really true. It's just part of the legend associated with him. But let me ask you a question. What if? What if Jesus isn't a liar? And what if Jesus wasn't a lunatic? And what if... Jesus isn't a legend. What if Jesus is exactly who he said he was? 
what then? Who then is this Jesus? In his classic book, Mere Christianity, perhaps you've heard of the author C.S. Lewis. He's really quite a well-known author. And if you haven't read Mere Christianity, I would commend it to you. It's a small read. It's an excellent read. But in his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes this, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. Who then is this? Who is Jesus? And whether you're here today and, and you've settled this in your heart and in your mind decades ago, or whether you're here today and you're undecided. Or maybe you haven't even really given it a whole lot of thought. I want to encourage you over the course of these 13 weeks to engage with this story. Use the intellect, use the reasoning, use the emotions, use the experiences that God has given you to honestly explore this story of who Jesus is. Now, as a resource, we're providing a couple of things for you. Grab your note sheets, if you will, and flip them over on the back side. On the back side, you're going to find this box, and we've redesigned that box. You, you may have become familiar with what had used to be in that box, but this is now a, deeper, a digging deeper box, and uh, we really want you to be interacting with the stories that we're talking about, the episodes that we're talking about here on Sunday morning. So we've put together these digging deeper questions. They're, they're there for you to use like on the drive home. Uh, maybe you want to use them over a dinner together. Uh, maybe you want to interact online about them. Maybe, however you want to use them, we just really want to encourage you, don't just come in here on Sunday morning and listen. We really want to encourage you to engage. Because ultimately, you don't need to know what I think about it. You need to be able to answer for you, who then is this? And so these questions will help wrestle. To the best of my ability, we're writing them without even a right answer. So I hope, you, I hope you enjoy those and I hope you engage with those. Those will be there for you every Sunday on your, uh, on your, your, uh, your note sheet. You see then below that, we've put a reading plan together. In 13 weeks, I can't preach the whole book. Even though it's a short book, it's the shortest of all of the Gospels, uh, I, I don't have time to preach all of the episodes. So what I've done is we've broken down the entire book into five weekly readings each week. And if you keep track with that, by the time we get to Easter, I think there's, I think the week of Easter, there's two or three readings left over. Now, I know some of you, some of you are, are just really diligent people and say, wait, 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 there's seven days of the week. Why did you only give me five readings? Well, I only gave you five readings because I know how busy my schedule is, and I presume yours is at least as busy, if not more busy. And there are just some days that I don't quite get around to doing something I want to do. So we've built in some flex time. We've gave you, given you five readings, which gives you two days to give an oops or a I was really busy. Now, if you're somebody who says, no, I want all seven, not a problem. On day one, focus on the passage that I've preached. That's Sunday, right? First day of the week. Then for the next five days, use the passages that are listed in the plan. And on the last day, on Saturday, Turn to the back of your program where you'll see the passage that I'll be preaching the coming Sunday. And that'll give you seven days if you're one of those folks. All right? If you want less, well, you're just going to have to track on your own if you want to stretch it out longer than that. I, we just, we really want you, we really want you to engage. Um, really think. Talk together. Uh, 
don't just believe something because I said it, please. Really dig in. Over these 13 weeks, let's, uh, let's wrestle with this question of, of who then is this. By, by the way, if you have to miss on a given Sunday, we understand that. In fact, Dad and I are going to miss two Sundays, aren't we? We're going to be on the other side of the planet, the other side of the equator too. But uh, So for two Sundays, even we're going to be missing. The Sundays that you have to miss, I want you to know, we, we live stream our services both 8.30 and 11 o'clock. And we also post the video, the sermon videos, as soon as we can after the services are over on Sunday. So those are there on our Facebook page, on the website, and on the YouTube channel. We're even going to post the Digging Deeper questions and the reading plan on both Facebook and our, uh, on our website. So however it's going to work best for you. In fact, maybe you have some friends or family members that you'd like to invite in on this experience with you. And maybe they're not able to get to Prince Street Church, or maybe they go to another church, or maybe they're just not ready to show up at a church yet. But, but they're okay talking with you. I invite you to use all of these resources, however God would have you use them, in order to, to engage in the story and come to conclusions about who Jesus is. But before we get to today's text, let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the way your Holy Spirit has carried along Mark in sharing the story of who Jesus is. And we thank you that your word promises that your Holy Spirit will lead us in truth. And so, God, I, I ask that you would lead my thoughts as I prepare these services, these sermons. I pray that you would lead our hearts together as we, as we wrestle, as we question, as we think. And Father, would you, by your Holy Spirit, help us truly know deep down in our soul who Jesus is. And we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I invite you to grab a Bible and join me at Mark chapter 1. If you want to use the copy that's in the rack right in front of you, feel free. If you're using that copy, the page numbers are in your program so you can get there quickly. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible it, and you'd like to take that copy with you, feel free. Uh, personally, I like to use my phone and my tablet for, for Bible reading myself, uh, but if you like paper copy and you'd like that copy, feel free to take it along with you. We'd be happy to, have, to give that to you as our gift. Uh, I also want you to know that I am using the New Living Translation throughout the course of this series, and so uh, if as I'm reading, you notice that the words I'm saying are not exactly the same as in your English translation of the Bible, well, that's because your English translation isn't a New Living Translation. And, uh, but the, the, the subject matter and the episode is going to be the same. So, given all of that, let me begin. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness... Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness, where he was tempted by Satan for forty days. He was out among the wild animals, 
and angels took care of him. Well, unlike the other gospel accounts, or at least some of the other gospel accounts, Mark doesn't give us a birth narrative on Jesus. Mark doesn't start, there's no angels, there's no shepherds, there's no manger, there's no wise men. There's not even a single mention about anything that happens until Jesus is about 30 years old. Instead, Mark starts right with the bottom line, identifying who Jesus is. He comes right out and says that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And so for all of those, or to all of those, who would write Jesus off as nothing but a good person or a great rabbi or a charismatic leader, Mark makes it clear that Jesus is both the proclaimer and the bringer of God's kingdom. That, that Jesus has come from God as God, that he's come to man as man in order to restore his people and bring the kingdom of God. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. A statement that John then backs up, that I'm sorry, that Mark then backs up with three stories that provide evidence that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. First, he points to the fulfillment of prophecy. And, and Mark, Mark uses prophecy to show that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, it's easy as you read through the passage to get, to get caught up in the peculiar clothing and the eccentric diet of this guy known as John the Baptist. And I will admit that he is an odd character. Uh, his clothing and his diet do provide some information, but they're not the point of the passage. Instead, the point of Mark including th this passage is the fulfillment of prophecy. Although Mark only mentions Isaiah, in reality, he quotes both Isaiah and Malachi. I I've, cr I've placed both of those passages of Scripture for you in your note sheet, so you have them to refer to during your study this week. But Mark points out these two passages of Scripture, both of which are at least four hundred years old. The Isaiah passage refers to preparing the way for God who is coming to restore his people. The Malachi passage speaks of God coming in judgment to set matters straight. And Mark declares that both these two texts, both these passages that have been recognized as Scripture for more than 400 years, both of these refer to Jesus. That these passages identify Jesus as the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And yes, the setting in the wilderness, and yes, the picture of John the Baptist in his weird clothing and his odd diet, they, they add to the storyline, but the bottom line for Mark is he's using these passages of Scripture to show that Jesus fulfills prophecy. By the way, this isn't the only time you're going to find Jesus' life fulfilling prophecy. And I want to encourage you that as you're thinking, as you're considering, as you're questioning the storyline that Mark provides, take notice to just how often Jesus fulfills prophecy. As whether it's his birth or whether it's his life, whether it's his death or his resurrection, time after time after time after time, Jesus fulfills prophecies which are at least four centuries old, and sometimes much, much older than that. And ask yourself the question, is it reasonable to think that one guy could fulfill that many different prophecies and not be who he says he is? Just give that thought as you're, as you're chewing on it in your brain. That would be a very difficult thing to create, and even if you were able to create it, how would you keep everybody quiet who was complicit in writing that story? 
one of the evidences that Mark points to when it comes to identifying that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, is the fulfillment of prophecy. And then Mark points to a second evidence, and that is the baptism. Jesus' baptism confirms his identity. And, and there is so much that we could talk about in this baptism passage, and not the least of which how radical an idea it would have been in a Jewish mind to be told that they have to come to God in the same way that Gentiles do, through repentance. That, that, would, have been, that would have been a really controversial statement. But we're going to have to save all of that for another day because the more significant part of the story, at least when it comes to confirming Jesus' identity, is what happens as Jesus comes up out of the water. Mark tells us that Jesus sees the heavens splitting open and the Holy Spirit descending on him as a dove. And there's two important details here. The first is this image of the heavens splitting open because here too we have another fulfillment of prophecy. If you look back at Isaiah chapter 64, the prophet writes this, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Okay, <laughs> check. We got that taken care of. Once again, Jesus fulfills prophecy. And we don't know whether it's just Jesus who sees this, the text doesn't seem to indicate that, or whether it's just he that sees this. Nevertheless, Jesus sees the heavens ripping open, and the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. And then what happens next, at least in my brain, at least in my heart, it sort of seals the deal. There's this voice from heaven who says, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Now, I don't know about your experience, but in my experience in life, I don't hear God's voice out loud very often. How about you? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think I can remember an occasion where I heard God's voice out loud that somebody else could hear it too. And that's exactly what happens here. Don't forget, the passage said that people from all over the region were crowding around John. And he baptized them. So it wasn't just Jesus who heard this voice. There's a large crowd of people who hear a voice from heaven, You are my dearly loved son. So even if you wanted to discount the fulfillment of prophecy as some sort of legend, you're going to have to deal with an out loud voice with a whole lot of witnesses. Jesus' baptism confirms his identity as the Messiah, the Son of God. And then Mark wraps up his prologue. And by the way, if you're a literary kind of a person, this whole opening section of the Gospel of Mark is known as his prologue. It's one, it's one specific section in which Mark is basically laying out his argument for the rest of the book. And as this prologue section of his, of his book closes... Mark points to one other evidence that Jesus is not just some cool guy, that he is, in fact, the Son of God, and that is his defeating of Satan. His text, the text tells us that, that the Holy Spirit compels Jesus to go out into the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that odd. Like, if, if I were writing this story, I would have the Holy Spirit sending Jesus into town to start his ministry not out where nobody is. But what's happening here is, is some significant symbolism. Again, for those of you who love literature, you, you know how important symbolism is. There, there's major symbolism going on here. You see, in, in an ancient mindset, the wilderness or those places where people don't go, that's where demons reside. In, in cemeteries, in, uh, in the wilderness, in places like that. So, so the symbolism that's going on here is that God himself sends his own son onto Satan's turf where he's confronted by Satan himself. And as we know from the text, Satan throws everything he has to throw at Jesus. And at every turn, Jesus is victorious. He defeats Satan on Satan's own turf. 
And then throughout the rest of the book, we're going to see Jesus doing this same thing over and over and over again, defeating Satan. Over the weeks, we're going to see Jesus um, driving out demons, healing the sick, demonstrating his, his sovereignty over not only the natural world, but also the supernatural world. We're even going to see him at the end as we approach Easter Day. We're going to see Jesus being victorious over Satan's religious and political representatives. And all along the way, we're just going to keep asking this question. Who then is this? Is Jesus a lunatic? Is he a liar? Is it just a legend? Or is Jesus exactly who he said he is? Who is Jesus in your heart, in your mind, in your soul? Well, this morning we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. It's something that we do the first Sunday of every year as a way of remembering and celebrating Jesus, the Messiah. 